Good morning on the west and afternoon on the east. Looky, 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 who's hey. here? Somebody's hey. been taking some time off. Look at you. Look at you. Look at yourself. What did you Look at yourself. What are you doing on your vacation? Uh, as, as you know, I, I sent you a picture. I was painting the house for much of the vacation, so I got a little work. A very productive vacation. This wasn't the classic go to the beach and just hang out and, and kick back. This was so work. You had what I call a classic staycation where you did all the things that you enjoyed to do, correct? Some of the things no. I enjoyed to do and some of the no. things I didn't really enjoy to do. Anyway, it's, <laughs> it's, it's nice. It's kind of a quiet transition back. There's not a lot of people here, but we do have. So, Carrie, I got breaking news right away. Is it back. really breaking? It is. We got breaking okay. news. ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski saying that Chauncey Billups has withdrawn his name from consideration for Cleveland's president of basketball operations job. Of course, David Griffin and the Cavs parted ways in June, and now Chauncey has decided he's he's not going to take the job there in Cleveland. For much more on this, let's bring in Woj. And uh, Adrian, what more can you tell us about that decision by Chauncey Billups? Well, Chauncey uh, let the Cavaliers know this morning that he was out of the process, um, that he had talked with Dan Gilbert and the organization, spent a couple days in Cleveland shortly after David Griffin was let go, and then there's been a back and forth here for the last uh, over a week between the sides. Um, and th they never could come to an agreement uh, on the parameters on the job. And I think, and, and Chauncey just issued me, I just got a statement from Chauncey that'll be, that'll be posted here soon at, at ESPN.com. But uh, essentially he's saying that the timing, he, he'd like someday to still run an NBA organization. But for him, the timing wasn't right, and, and he's going to stay. He's going to stay at ESPN and, and, and stay as an analyst here. All right, you talk about timing. It's not great timing not to have your decision maker in place mm -hmm. with free agency going. Where does this leave Dan Gilbert and the Cavs? Well, they have an assistant general manager, Kobe Altman, who has been manning the phones, been running their their trade talks, their free agency, and, and Dan Gilbert is very hands on there, and that's that's part of the reason Dave Griffin is no longer there and uh, you know the owner takes on that role there and that's the case in, in many other organizations too but Altman is very capable well respected around the league he was deep in the con he was deep in putting together the package that potentially would have brought Cleveland Paul George that Indiana moved in uh, another direction and did the Oklahoma City deal at the very end so he's at a de he's adept at putting together big deals he's been part of that as and David Griffin staff so for right now, Kobe Altman will continue to lead their front office, and now Dan Gilbert has to pivot and decide whether he wants to look in the direction of Altman or does he want to continue to look outside the organization uh, to target someone else because Chauncey Billups was Dan Gilbert's target from the moment that he let David Griffin go. Hey, uh, Adrian, obviously over the last few years, LeBron has been a pretty good recruiter there in <laughs> Cleveland. We've heard that he's been less active with free agents this offseason. What should we read into that? Well, they don't have – they're not in a position to lure big free agents. They don't have salary cap space. They're capped out uh, unlike anybody in the league. So they're looking at veteran minimum type deals, and uh, th there's no star quality that's available uh, to them here in free agency. So they, they've been really more focused on the trade front here. All right, so we shouldn't look – deeply into that it's just sort of how it, it, things present itself with their cap david could you repeat that for me i, I was just saying that just to just to put a, a bow on that it's basically you're saying that it's it's not as much what lebron is or is not doing it's just the fact that he, they don't have much cap room and so there isn't much recruiting to be done no there isn't and, and listen i think he's uh uh listen th they're going to have an opportunity here to bring in veteran players uh, who might, is this market, what, what's going to happen now is the market's going to shake out and as players realize they're not getting the deals, the financial deals they thought they might get somewhere else, there'll be some players, Golden State, any of the contenders will be in a position to, to sign players at that veteran minimum who want to play with LeBron, want to play potentially for a championship, but free agency isn't quite to that point yet. A lot of those players are still looking for bigger deals. That usually shakes out over the month of July here. Okay. Our NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski, giving us the, the news that Chauncey Billups will not be in the front office of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Kerry, back to you.
All right, David, thank you. He also reports that Carmelo Anthony is open to waiving his no trade clause to go to the Rockets or the Cavs. In Houston, he would join uh, his friend James Harden, but his best friend Chris Paul, as you know, recently there. In Cleveland, it would be LeBron. Melo has two years and $54 million left on his deal, plus a trade kicker that could pay him more than $8 million. Uh, life as an NBA player is really good. We'll get to that eventually. Uh, meanwhile, we welcome in our next reporter, Ian Begley. Thank you so much for joining us on this holiday weekend. Um, in your opinion, uh, you know Mello well. You've covered him for some time. Better fit for the Rockets or for the Cavs? I look at that Houston team and I think about Carmelo and, and what he did on those Olympic teams as kind of just a, a third option, spot up shooter, how deadly he was. And I think he could fill that role in Houston with Chris Paul and James Harden, you know, as long as he could work things out with Mike D'Antoni, I think he could be a, a pretty deadly weapon for those Houston Rockets. So, you know, you look at on court fit, I understand some people say there wouldn't be enough balls to go around between Chris Paul, James Harden and Carmelo. But think back to those Olympic teams and, and how well he played off of guys and how many open looks he got. And, and I think he could be so effective in that role under Mike D'Antoni. If he had a choice, though, don't you think he'd want to go play with LeBron as opposed to CP3? Or is it equal in terms of his loyalty? You know, he's so close to both of those guys. I don't know if he would put one over the other. I don't want to speak for him. I just know that, you know, outside of, of New York, this is kind of a dream scenario for him, getting a chance to play with LeBron James or getting a chance to play with Chris Paul, you know, two of his closest friends in the NBA and in life. So I, I think that's why he's open to Houston. He's open to Cleveland. And I'm sure, you know, a perfect scenario for Carmelo is to get a buyout and to go to the team of his choice, whether it's Houston, Cleveland, or elsewhere. But I don't think the Knicks are open to that right now. They're not willing to part with Carmelo Anthony without getting assets back, and, and they'd yeah. like to bring on assets that are young and cheap. So they're kind yeah. of at a standstill right now. Yeah, you're right. Again, for everyone at home, two years left on the deal, $54 million, and if he is traded, more than $8 million in a kicker. You know what? I, I'm in the wrong uh, position. I think that I should have been an NBA player. What about you? I'm with you, Carrie. I mean, you I should have worked okay, on my good. jump shot. I should have worked on my vertical. Yeah. 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 You didn't do that, right? No, not enough. Not <laughs> enough. I, I, I don't know where I went wrong, but you and I both could have gotten paid these last couple of days if, uh, if we followed our dreams and, and went to the it NBA. I, I agree. I agree. Um, Ian Begley, thank you so much for joining us from New York. Uh, David, I'm going to send it back to you. You, too, could have been a basketball player making millions right now. I, very close. Just missed on that NBA contract. Uh, we've got our NBA analyst, Tom Penn, in here with us. We always ask you to do the impossible. We hear that, that Mello's decided. <laughs> that that was the Houston impossible. Local. Begley is an NBA player. That's <laughs> okay. the impossible. Right. Or us. Fit him in. And let's start with Houston and, and spitball a trade or maybe a three-team, whatever it would take to get Melo in a Rockets uni. It's tricky to do this because we, well, we know the new deal here. Chris Paul front and center along with James Harden. Uh, in terms of the assets they're going to need to make a deal happen, here's the five on the floor that I have because if they're going to bring Carmelo Anthony in via trade, mm -hmm. Anderson is the money that works. A lot of money has to go out to bring in his 26.2. Anderson's the start of that, but we've heard they don't want Ryan Anderson. Okay. So I'm going to come back, bring Carmelo out, and I'm going to try to do now a two-for-one with Melo with Ariza. And then we'd also have to get uh, Gordon out of here. So I'll bring in P.J. Tucker because their money is going to have to come out if they're going to bring in 26.2. Okay. Now, this is fine for the Rockets. I'm sure they'd be happy with this because now they have a new big three to take a look at. You got him, you got him, and you got him. And you got Melo right in the middle of an Olympic-type experience, an all-star-type experience, and he's been a different player in those settings. He wasn't very good with Mike D'Antoni when he's the lead option. He's actually proving to be a loser in that role. He could be a winner in this role. He'd behave differently, and I think that's why it would be a fit. But we got to do a whole other thing to see whether this makes sense for New York, which it doesn't, which is why we'd have to get into a three-way deal giving these assets to somebody else to get New York what they want. Seems like you're giving up a lot of 
good young players, especially they gave up guys in the Chris Paul deal, yep. for aging, aging. The, guy, the guys need the basketball in their hands. I yeah. mean, is this, is this really the recipe to, to... It's called go for it. Now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you got one or two good years of these guys, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mello to the Cavs. How would mm -hmm. you do that? Let's... Uh, so I would take Mello. Here. He'd go right in the middle of the Cavs. Okay. okay. Now, this team is totally capped out. We know that. They're into the luxury tax. The way that they got him there was Kevin Love was there. So, Kevin Love, you see the similarity in the money. Over a little bit different, right? There's a slop factor where you could be within. The fudge factor. Fudge slop factor. factor. I like that. You like too. that too? That's okay. Good. Yeah, that works. We can get that but look, they're going to have to give up at least around $22 million if they're going to bring in Mello's $26 million plus his trade kicker. And he could be kicked up another $8 million over two years. Um, again, same problem. Does he fit for the Knicks, right? But we know that this would now work from a talent standpoint. You'd have this guy leading the way. Uh, don't forget about him, right? And then you put Mello with him. You know, it's pretty interesting to see that big three along with Thompson, along with J.R. Smith or whoever else you want to bring in off the bench. You think that would be a better they, team than they, with Kevin Love? At, yes. Mello for Love is a better yes. team. Yes, this guy just scores the ball. We can talk all about, I just called him a loser. We can tell all about the things that are wrong when he's in the role he's in in New York. Mm -hmm. But you put him with this kind of talent, okay. he's a beast. He's okay. unguardable. All right. So there you have And you think a third team would be necessary here or would just be a... Probably, because I don't think Kevin Love uh, fits in New York on their timetable. Right. I think they would want to flip him to Phoenix. Uh, earlier I talked about him flipping to Boston, but I forgot about the fact that that would be Boston helping Carmelo get here. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm rescinding my last right. stupid idea. You can take that back. <laughs> we asked you to come up with a lot of ideas. You, you throw them against the wall and some of them. I'd look at Phoenix in this case. I'd say send Kevin to Phoenix and they got a lot of young pieces and we could throw something together and make it work. All right. Here we go. Uh, Tom Penn giving us some thoughts. Uh, Kerry, kick it back to you. All right, David. Uh, so, David, another David Jacoby of Jalen and Jacoby joins us now. Uh, if you guys didn't hear this just in, uh, Carmelo Anthony is open to playing with one of his friends in Cleveland or in Houston. Uh, Ian Begley reporting that uh, Chris Paul has been working on this since the beginning of the year, saying in terms of, I'd like to play with my friend. It's no surprise. You already know what the Banana Boat crew wants to do. Mm -hmm. That's why we're yellow. Banana Boat Day. Because I, I feel it's like something, something day. major could happen. Uh, best scenario for Carmelo, in your opinion? The best scenario for Carmelo Anthony is first, just get out of New York. Just get out of New York. It is a dumpster fire of a franchise currently, and he's going to leave, and they want him out too. So, but the best part about this is he has a no-trade clause. They have to ask his permission to trade him. Only LeBron James and Dirk Nowitzki are the other players in the NBA. Great work by Phil Jackson. I don't know why he ever signed that. But anyway, <laughs> as enticing as it is for him to go to play with the Rockets, I don't think he's a fit for what they want to do philosophically. They shoot a lot of threes and layups, and they already have two point guards, and they want to move the ball. And, Le and Carmelo Anthony is a ball stopper. The best fit for him when it comes to these options is the Cleveland Cavaliers, in my opinion. One of the Cavaliers' biggest problems was LeBron James gets tired. They just simply couldn't function when LeBron right. James wasn't on the floor. And what Carmelo Anthony can do is, is help out when LeBron James is on the bench. And LeBron James led the league in minutes. This would take a lot of minutes off of LeBron James's plate, and he would not be as exhausted as he was when we saw him in the fourth corner, quarter of those finals games. But here's my question. Every, and, and, and when Ian said this, I, I should have asked him, do we, we have short memories, right? Because mm -hmm. Mike D'Antoni, and from my understanding, uh, Carmelo did not get along when he was the coach of the Knicks. Do you think bygones be bygones if he ends up uh, playing for the Rockets? Well, there's I, a, feel, I feel as if it'd come back. There's a term that winning is the best deodorant. Okay. You know, so when you're losing, of course things are going poorly. But when, when you've got Chris Paul and James Harden and Carmelo Anthony on the same team, if that's sure. happening, sure. guess what? It's going to go, go great. And you know what else happened with Mike D'Antoni? He was bad yeah. for the Knicks. He was bad for the Lakers. And now... Coach He's of the great. year. He's Winning great. is the best deodorant. S system. Um, okay, so if Melo went to the Cavs, if, as you suggested, does that keep LeBron there? Or, or do we, are we all under the impression that LeBron's a, a, a one-year rental? He got, it he's feels out. like it. Doesn't yeah. it feel like it now? It I mean, there way. were these reports that he's going. I think the truth of the matter is that LeBron James's heart of hearts does not know what he's going to do. That's fair. I think that's fair, right? But when you look at all this, he's not, there's reports that he's not recruiting free agents to come to the Cavs. And then there's also reports that he wants to go to the Lakers. And everybody seems to say he wants to go to the Lakers. Like, it's a done deal. I know you love that because I know you love your. I mean, I, I know just you love LA. You can just hit him on the text. Hit, hit Irv, Irving on the text. Irv. Hit him up and see what's happening. But, like, we all assume that he's going there. But 
The Cavs haven't done much. Uh -huh. Remember, LeBron just lost to the, he almost got swept by the oh. Warriors. And what have they done? They signed Jose Calderon. They're like, yeah. you know what, LeBron, uh -huh. we are Jose Calderon away from yeah. beating those Warriors. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to get it okay. done. Okay, but let's, let's be fair. Right, let's take a look at the landscape. Oh, there is no team, no matter how many people they sign, God bless the Rockets, right? They put, they're going to put all these players in. They, they've got James Harden. They have Chris Paul. Maybe they get mellow. Uh, does that really make them um, a serious contender against the Warriors? Yes. I, I, you, do you think yes. they could actually beat the Warriors? Did you put Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, and James Harden on the same basketball team? Right. That is a team that can compete with the Warriors. They can compete. Can they beat them? My point yes. is, is like, I would think LeBron is like, there. That's a couple of moves away, as opposed to one or two player moves away. That's yes. a, a few would more. Would they be favored? No. Could they beat the Warriors? Yes. But this is all hypothetical because Carmelo Anthony is now in the New York Knicks, and that Knicks team is not beating anybody. I like anybody, this. This is the perfect Warriors. time. I like hypotheticals. Yeah. So I <laughs> this like is why the what summer is fun. It's all speculation. It's We're all in the barbershop right now. Okay. Exactly. All right. So, uh, what about the other friend in the banana boat who's actually has a banana boat by himself, uh, Dwayne Wade? What's going on with my guy? Dwayne Wade is all alone on vacation. And you know, he's watching ooh. all this banana boat brother stuff happening, and he's just alone, now, alone. with Gabrielle Union. A hard life. You know, in just Monaco. on a yacht. It's, in a, Monaco. Tough, it's a tough life. Yeah, yeah but. Uh, Let's take a listen uh, to him just, you know, trying to get over things. Nobody's on the banana boat this year. Aw, the lonely banana boat. Story, bro. That's a true story, bro. Lonely banana boat. That is not what he signed. When he went to Chicago, this is not what he signed up for. Jimmy Butler's right. gone. Rondo's gone. He's, now he's his lonely banana boat brother all by himself in Chicago. So it'd be interesting I, to see what happens if he gets bought out. I would think they would want to, but you, do they keep him around because just the veteran presence? Veteran leadership. And buying a player out, I mean, you're, it's just like, it's, it's kind of silly. It's just like, here's a bunch of money. Now go away. But it still doesn't help you with the salary cap or anything. So I'm I not think, so sure that they'll buy him out. Yeah, maybe he's asking. I hope they do, too. For because, him. He looks yeah. lonely. He looks sad. Yeah. He was hanging out. Okay, so we have an explain yourself. I, I love when you're here because we can do these explain yourself. Let's do it. This is one of my favorite players in the NBA, you guys. Now that Kobe's retired, I always have to put that on. <laughs> um, here we go. Take a look at this Explain Yourself. It's Kawhi Leonard. He ran some errands. Mm -hmm. And um, he's wearing, what is he wearing? Are he's those... wearing game shorts. Yeah. And, he's wearing game shorts and Tim and, Duncan socks, and he's carrying a Gatorade. It seems like he's ready for an NBA game at any time, at any day. I mean, he's, he's a basketball robot. Yeah, I do not I, think he's a human being. Where do you put yeah, your wallet? Where yeah. do you put your keys? He, he, How do you get in your car? I mean, he's not shopping, clearly. He's just, because he doesn't shop. Remember? He, he's, he's frugal. He saves. He's, of course he doesn't shop. He's wearing game <laughs> shorts. Wearing, those are all three I items. Like if you look in his closet, it's just Spurs uniforms, and that's it. Uh -huh. like, that's all he has. He's, like, if you invite him to your wedding, you can. Uh -huh. He's going to show up in his first. He uniform. may have had a pocket on the T-shirt that may have had like a credit card in there. Or I don't know. I don't think so. You don't, I don't like think that? He even pays what the, about the Tim Duncan? His what about the Tim Duncan socks? Where do you get those? Where do you cop a pair of those at? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I don't, don't have any Tim Duncan socks. Lies. I don't believe right. you. I only have Tim Duncan. I'm sorry, I don't believe right. you. All I right. only have Tim Duncan. <laughs> Jacoby hanging out with us uh, on this holiday weekend because I'm just taking it all the way forward. It's a weekend? Days. Yeah, like weekend. Oh, still, why am I working? Because you're hanging out with us. Oh, because you invited me. That's right. Thank you. I'll always I always come by. It. And hang out. Jacoby's there. All right, we're around. I'll see. All right, we found out where Marshawn is, and he's not going to get fined for this either. He was actually attending <laughs> a, a charity soccer game hosted by the Seattle Sounders. He struggles with the rules of soccer, I think. I think so. Like going through the blue team like no big deal. Oh! oh! <laughs> <laughs> the red team in the 46th minute goes up four to two as long as they're not calling a handball. Oh. <laughs> they lose the yeah. flip-flop. Yeah. He, I'm he here did for everything there. He, I'm here for all of that. Like whatever, I'm doing it my way. Did you see you the know? keeper? The keeper's like trying to yes. figure out how I'm going to tackle this guy. He just turned yeah, it down. Not, I want yeah. nothing to do with with uh, yeah. Marshawn here. It's, it's all you, my friend. You got it. You know how that's how we do the show, David. We just do, we just take over. We yeah. just do whatever we want. We break want. rules. We, we yes. knock red cards out of the referee's hands. That's how we roll, <laughs> isn't it? We blow through stop signs. Producers exactly. love that. Um, so uh, let's talk about, let's go from NFL to NBA, but talk about the two, if you will. I don't know if you know this because you were on vacation. Yeah, I don't know anything. Uh, uh, Steph Curry, Blake Griffin, and Kyle Lowry are just a few of the huge deals in the first few days of free agency. Combined, they'll make $473 million, almost $20 million more than Sheesh. what seven of the top NFL players combined make. But you know what? Listen, Jeesh is right. That's guaranteed money. Guaranteed money, David. No matter what, that's With mine. With a G. Yes. With a G yes, big G. So Sammy Watkins went to the Twitter 
Uh, if I was him, I'd weigh in too. So here's what he said. They should be paid more and that the class of 2014 will change the market. We got to get paid more. I'm with you. J.J. Watt, basketball money is on another level right now, fully guaranteed. Again, Big G, ain't mad at you. Get what you can get. Um, I don't know, David. It's a lot that? of money. Uh, he might be a little mad. He, he might be a little mad. I think Greg Olson, uh, the Panthers uh -huh. tight end, tweeted, when you yeah. see NBA free agency and this, yeah. this little tyke doing his step, look at that. That's really good stuff. I don't know if that's... Uh, listen, who that uh, start is. him young, David, because wow. that means that's retirement you're taking care of. That's seven hundred million guaranteed, right, right there. there. You start right there. Okay, so look at this, uh, JJ mm -hmm. Redick. Everyone sort of was shocked at what JJ got. Uh, one year, twenty-three million to play for the Sixers. You I was shocked. Compare that to some huge names in the NFL, and he, his contract, at least for the next year, dwarfs what these guys are going. To be. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers is on there. Le'Veon Bell, Julio, Joe, all these guys, yeah. and uh, JJ Redick is making a ton more. Than those fellas. So, wait, wait a minute. What did you just minute. say? What did you just say? JJ Reddick just made what? Twenty-three million for one year. One year. Guaranteed, by the way. It's all good. How, you're a you're a it's former NFL player. How, how does this set with you? It's just unbelievable. I mean, I, I agree with the, what the players are seeing. I mean, the players right now, there's no OTAs, there's no camps going on. They're sitting here right now watching us on Sports Center and watching all these big contracts come out and. And it happens like it's like this every year now. I mean, it's just, just coming out with all the social media now. Guys are, are voicing their opinion. But I remember playing ball and watching not only the NBA players, but the baseball players come up with these big contracts. And it was just mind-boggling to see the time that we, we put in as NFL football players and all the games and the physicality of everything. And then to see these basketball players and guys like a J.J. Redick. Hey, no offense. He's, hey, and he should. He's, hey, he should make the money that he makes. But one year, $23 million, that's, that's extreme. It's basically, it's better to be J.J. Redick than J.J. Watt right now, right? I mean, that's, Absolutely. that's sort of how it, how it slices. Absolutely. All right, but so. That's J.J.'s fault. That's J.J. Watt's fault. I mean, J.J. Watt did an extension with two years left on his contract in 2014 instead of play it out and go to the market. So there, there's, there's, the field there, is slanted against NFL players. The field is, is slanted against NFL players, but not against NFL superstars. If J.J. Watt had wanted to play out his contract and insist uh, on the Texans giving him more or guaranteeing more, he would have had them over a barrel. NFL players don't do that. Because they're not a, as good of a bargaining position. Isn't that correct? And, be, and because CBA. of the injury risk, I think. And I, I just think the, the, the culture of one league is, is so different from the culture of the other from a bargaining standpoint. They've never had that kind of success in terms of getting those kinds of gains, either in collective bargaining or individual bargaining, uh, which is really the key here. We've talked about this, uh, with, this yeah. with the star players. The ability of a, of a big-time player and his agent to insist on a big-money deal or insist on a fully guaranteed deal, we haven't seen that in the NFL. But I think it's a lot to do with the culture, too. I mean, you and I talked about this in the green room. The culture in the NFL is it's a hard cap, and we all know that it's a hard cap, unlike the NBA and, and, and baseball. But in those, the culture is a guy like a Derek Carr or a big-time quarterback, when their contract's up, they don't want to take all the money because it's a hard cap. They want to build around them as well. And I think mm -hmm. the organization gives, that, gives them that guilt feeling of, yep. hey, listen, right. you can't just take all the cap. We still have to build around you. We still have to sign this offensive tackle. We still got to sign a corner. And they end up taking less, like Tom Brady. They want to build around them. They want to build a championship team. So that's the culture within the NFL as well. Uh, it's interesting. The NFL grosses, uh, I think, 50% more than the NBA. Ugh. And yet the players are not quite making what the NBA players are making right now. Da Dan and Woody with us talking about the disparity between the two leagues. Uh, Carrie, back to you. All right, David, thank you. From Wimbledon this morning, Venus Williams was asked after her match about the car accident in which one passenger was left dead from the other car. The man died last month, 13 days after the crash. Venus is being sued by the man's family for her role in the accident. In a statement last week, Venus said she was devastated and heartbroken by the accident. An emotional Venus Williams this morning talking to the media for the first time since the accident. I'm completely speechless and it's just, yeah, I mean, I'm just, before we take any further questions for Venus, um, please be aware she's unable to say anything more about this. So I'd ask you to respect her wishes, please. 
Can we just tennis. give it give her a minute, please? Do you want to take a minute? Yeah, uncomfortable and, and heartbreaking to watch. Venus returned a few minutes later to answer a few questions about the second round match she goes on to. Uh, we'll have more closer. So Chris Haynes joins us now. Gordon Hayward has emerged, and I've actually been hearing about this for some time now uh, from Brian Windhorst, that he's one of the hot free agents. Uh, they have seemed to roll out the carpet for him. Tell me about his visit to Boston and what it all means. Well, look, a lot of people don't know. He was, he's in Salt Lake City, a small market team. Gordon Hayward, over the course of his career, has improved each and every season. So it's only right that he puts himself in position to be coveted by the likes of the Boston Celtics, the Miami Heat. He's the real deal now. Look, and, and if you look at what the Celtics can offer him as far as the potential to get to the NBA Finals relatively easy, that's what they provide. But also, Miami provides that elsewhere. The dilemma that he faces is that Utah is doing everything that they can to bring him back. Like I said, the dilemma and the problem is the Golden State Warriors over there. There's not really a realistic path for him to get to the finals. So that's something he's going to have to deal with. Do I ch chase a, a finals appearance or do I stay here and wait out the dynasty that is the Warriors? All right, Chris, help me understand something. I'm a little confused. So the dilemma is that he is getting uh, enticed by his current team or the Golden State Warriors. What's the dilemma? Well, the, the dilemma is he's getting enticed by his team. And, and we all, most people think that he's going to resign with Utah. But the dilemma is, do you stay in Utah and wait out the dynasty that is the Golden okay. State Warriors? Most people okay. believe that the Warriors are in the bag for the NBA Finals for the next three, maybe four years. If he goes over there to the Eastern Conference, what most people are right now calling the Eastern Conference, they figure he would have a much better chance to get to those finals. Because remember, right. the Cavaliers are one injury away from a key player from allowing anybody to dethrone them, talking Toronto, Washington, Miami, Boston. So uh, that's the dilemma he has. All right, so what's the perception of him around the league? Well, it's, it's definitely changed. I remember when he first came into the league, when I would talk with players in the locker room, they were like, can this white guy play? Can he really get it done? You remember, he was getting a lot of hype coming out of Butler, all the stereotypes, that you know, the typical comments that come with that. But I think his game speaks for itself. I think you can see that he's an all-star type player. And I remember talking with Kevin Durant during the course of this season and just talking to him off to the side. I asked him, who's the most underrated player that nobody talks about? Mm. He said, Gordon Hayward. So I, I think that speaks volumes. All right. So, yeah, it does, especially if that's coming from Kevin Durant. Gordon Hayward, uh, a hot free agent. Um, a lot of people are interested in him, as you can say, but he doesn't want to stay in the West and have to wait for the Golden State Warriors to be this dynasty, if you, as you say. And now he's may consider going to Boston or, I don't know, is there another team on the table for him? No, it's, it's pretty much those three. Those, those are the three options. And, and look, it's, it's going to come down to how can he better help himself. You got to remember, he wants to take that next step. You know, it's all, it's all about money and that he's going to be taken care of financially wherever, whichever way he chooses to go. But with Miami, he can be the missing piece. Boston, he can be the missing piece to take them to the next level. When you go back to Utah, there's familiarity. They're doing everything they can to bring him back and bring a good roster around him. But is he the missing piece in the Western Conference to take him to the next step? That's, that's, going, to be, that's going to be a tough decision for him to make. 
All right, Chris Haynes, speaking of tough decisions, I have to wrap this interview sadly and give it back to David because apparently he wants to work. I don't know. He's on vacation. <laughs> He wants to work. I now. want the ball. I want the ball. Get me the ball. <laughs> Apparently. We got that's Tom what they Penn say. back with us. Uh, all right, so let's, let's take a look at both Boston and Miami and see how this would work and what he would mean. We had the old haircut, by the way, on Gordon Hayward. Yeah. Not the new the stylish. The new do, right? right? All right, so we got Boston up. To, uh, take us through this and what it would look Well, this is Danny Ainge's plan A, was maintain all these key assets, right? All this depth, and then remember what they've got here. On the bench as well, Tatum, the number three pick. Brown, the last number three pick. Smart, he's taking eighth in the draft. And all these draft picks, so they're not making any trades. So the idea is that Gordon Hayward comes into this space and then sits right in the middle of this new roster. That's what he always wanted, Danny Ainge, because everything else is slowly going away. To have Hayward as a finisher with Thomas, you know, you got to look at the production from this kid Average 22 a game, he shoots 47%, 40 from three, which is what they need. He's just a well-rounded player, and the best thing he did was finish games for them. In the playoffs, under pressure, now you'd have two great dynamic finishers, and Bradley last year showed he can do it too. So I think this is about trying to get one more stud to lead them, and here's the deal. If they don't do it now, they're going to lose this cap space because next summer he gets paid and he gets paid. These little numbers go away. <laughs> they go to big numbers and no more cap space for the Celtics. So the pressure's on to do it now. Okay. Will he be re reunited with Brad Stevens? We'll see how that plays out. He met with uh, the Heat as well. If, yeah. you, if you pop up Miami and take a look at, at what he would mean to their lineup, what do you see? Well, you'd put him – it's another fit – with a big three. It's all about positional for him. Mm -hmm. And you got to think about a point guard that's going to take care of getting him the ball in Dragic. I guarantee you this was their, their uh, sales pitch. And then a big man to protect the rim, set big screens, like what he's used to with Rudy Gobert. And then him just being able to shine in the sunshine state along with those assets. So along with those stars. And then there's a couple other stars that I guarantee you they were pitching on. And Sarley Tyler Johnson and Josh McRoberts, it's not you guys. It's here. It's Pat Riley as the president and Eric Spolstra as the coach. If you put those two in there, they are so proven in what they do. And you've got a couple of the best leaders in the league, a proven leader, and then an amazing head coach who is the kind of guy you'd want to play for. So that's the core nucleus that they would pitch him on is these players along with these players, but the right head coach, the right president, organizational alignment, no state income taxes, your it's wife changed. is happy. It's, it's sunny, just a wonderful warm. place to be. So tough decision for sure because he can make $40 more million, $44 more million dollars in Utah. Okay, so it's down to Utah, Boston, and Miami, it seems like, for Gordon Hayward's services. All right, other news. Our agent, Wojnowski, reporting that Derrick Rose is meeting with the Bucks today. Rose averaged 18 a game last season with the Knicks. All right, how would he fit in with Milwaukee? You put him with the Greek freak. He got some other pieces. They just re-signed Tony Snell. What do you see in there in, in Bucks land? I think it's going to be hard to get him in here. Let's think about why they want to do it. You mentioned it. The Greek freak is their superstar, right? Parker had a great year last year, but he got hurt, and then they end up with the rookie of the year in Brogdon. So how does Derrick Rose fit with that young talent? And I'll have Maker as a young center as well. The challenge they're going to have is that they have 13 players under contract. They're already $20 million over the cap. And all they have is the mid-level exception to work with. I don't know if Derrick Rose is going to work with the mid-level exception because you put him in here, it's only going to be $8.4 million right now if they okay. do a little maneuvering. Derrick Rose comes into this mix. Now, why do they want him? They want him because this guy is a complementary piece who's going to attack the rim. We all talk about the warts of Derrick Rose, but this is what he does. He will get to the rim. He will finish. He will shoot that short little jumper. And he will play in transition and score the ball. That fits with the other players they have. And they can have Brogdon still sort of run the show as a traditional point guard, have Rose be a dynamic playmaker, and then really complement the Greek freak and Parker. It, it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if they can pull it off because I think Rose he'll gets more cash somewhere else. He'll command a lot more money, you think. Should. But he may love it to get close enough to Chicago and... 
uh, be on a what would make them a really interesting team in the East. Absolutely. Uh, Tom Penn with us, talking us through some of the scenarios we could see from Derrick Rose and, and Gordon Hayward as well. I don't know if you know that. What do you got? What happened? Yeah, okay. So, Serena, did you hear about Serena and John McEnroe? And, I you did. know, and it, she can beat somebody who was 700. You got very exercised about this, did you not? You were. I got very outraged. exercised about this because I was like, what's the point? Like, er, only in tennis do we have to start comparing men and women. What is the point? She's great. She's a great athlete. As if men are the standard and women, what they do doesn't really matter. So, that's why, that's how I took it. Well, I don't think John meant any harm by it. But John, as you well know, our colleague mm -hmm. often can put his foot in said mouth. This morning, our other colleague, Chris McKendry, who's also a tough cookie, uh, talk to him about it. So take a listen okay. and let's see what you think. <laughs> Uh, plenty, plenty. Because uh, she also said something along the lines that she wanted to, you know, respect my privacy, let me just do my thing. And then I saw her doing a Demi Moore the lookalike thing on the cover of Vanity Fair. What does that what have, to do, that have to do with anything? She looked awfully well, that, good on I mean, that. She though. looked great, but that's, you know, did she want to be private? Was she looking for a little publicity there? Bottom line, John, uh, will you not take the bait yeah. on this topic again? Uh, Chris, if that makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah, okay, it does. It, it makes all women I feel better. Bottom yeah. line, John. Bottom line, John. What do you think of that? You're quiet. You're always I the thought, quiet one. I I'm always the one I, getting I in trouble. I thought it was a fascinating little dynamic there between you had two women and two men and, uh, and John McEnroe. You know, he does, not, uh, he does not back down very easily. So He does not. It was good stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Let's back away Speaking of Wimbledon, from that whole back thing. Back away. And, and pedal back. We, we got a top five. Again. Remember the top five? Do you remember the top five? Vaguely, what do we do in that, we, well, that situation? I put out a top five list. You put out a top five list. And we compare. And we had a judge. It's great. All right. Number five for me is the, the, the epic marathon between Isner and Mahu. Court 18. Took three days, 11 hours. I remember. 70, 68 in the fifth, Isner. So that's that's got to be on anybody's list. Number four. Anybody's list. 1993, Yana Nevada. She's serving up 4-1 in the third against Steffi Groff. She's going to win Wimbledon. And then she couldn't get her serve in. She just fell apart. It was so sad. Then what a what a human moment. She cried on the shoulder of the Duchess of Kent. Remember this moment here? She gets her little her dish, but uh, she wasn't happy. You say you don't? You don't remember that? I don't remember that moment, but now, go, go I, now that back. you told me You're about it. You're yeah. just way too young. Uh, yeah. Three, Arthur <laughs> Ashe. Jimmy Amen, Connors David. was a stud, and Arthur Amen. Ashe came through. Just Eight. Everyone thought he was over the hill, and he stunned Connors and won Wimbledon. Number Talk two. about it. The tie break. We're going to get back to Johnny Mack. Here we go. 18-16 uh -huh. in the fourth set. However, I, I kind of forgot about it. Borg came back and won the fifth. He lost the tie break, but won the fifth, and then Borg would retire a year later. How, how hot was Borg? You want to talk about that? Uh, no, I do not want to talk about that. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know what you mean by hot, but let's look at the guns <laughs> on the doll here. 2008. <laughs> McEnroe called this oh. the greatest match he's ever seen. Yeah. A couple rain delays. You know, I'm a Fed guy. Yes. And Nadal finally yeah. won it. It was dark. Yeah, it lasted Federer 9-7 in the fifth. Most Man. people think that was one of the great matches they've no. ever seen anywhere, no. anytime. You are, you are absolutely right. That Arguably, they, they, they long for those days. And I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a Fed guy, too. He's just so elegant, and people just root for him. He's a favorite, but that was special. All right, here's my list. I only got video at number five, and Ooh. then the rest... And the rest are just well, giving me a list not, that's here, That's a folks. bad sign for your list if you've only got <laughs> one piece of video. <laughs> Andy Murray, I can't believe you didn't put this on. When he won, he ended a 77-year drought for his home. What, I cannot believe you didn't put that on Whoops. there. What's going on? Whoops, I missed that one. Whoops. And then, and then what? And then you're, Nicholas Mahu, John Isner, uh, right there, the three thing. days okay. with you. Okay, Borg so, McEnroe. Bo you know, there is a um, HBO special about them. Uh, have you seen that? I think it was called... Uh, Moment of the court, magic moment. I, I can't remember. Um, Ash, obviously, you put that on there, and Federer versus Nadal. I have, I, however, have been told by the judge that I made a huge omission, and I have, and it's my fault because it's at the end of the day, it's my list. I forgot about Athea Gibson. I, I literally shame, shame on both of you, actually. 60 years ago this year, she became the first person of color to win Wimbledon. How can you miss that? I know. We got Arthur I'm ashamed. on there. Arthur. <laughs> no. He, he yeah, got, over the hill. Yeah. <laughs> on, on the hills of the John McEnroe comment, you said we got Arthur and totally ignore Althea. I got you. I got you. I, 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 forgive us. <laughs> Thank, that's why you're here, because you're, you're the tennis expert. That's why you're here. So yeah. if you had to take a look at those lists, what do you think? 
I'm going with yours, Carrie, mainly because of I was there with Andy Murray one to be on, on that court, to listen to that crowd, to be in that country at that moment was just truly historic. I think 89 to 90 percent of all televisions in the UK at that moment was watching the match. It was absolutely magical. And to beat your longtime Djokovic to do so, awesome moment. But the rest of the list, as you said, is hard to argue with. OK, so so listen, uh, do you see his shirt, David? You see what he has on his shirt? Yes. Is, is he going to do it this year, LZ? This would be unbelievable. He would break Ash's hoping, record, right? For the I, oldest. I, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that he's able to do so. But uh, you know, he's got a tough feeling. Roth is looking great. Yes. Nadal's I like your green. LZ Granderson joining us. Thank you, LZ. I like Thank your you. green.